Hey there athletes, Coach John Ferry here from Team Wilpers. Excited as always to welcome you to our week five athlete briefing for our winter run and half marathon challenge 2024. I hope everyone is having a great week four, all easy runs throughout this week. Hopefully you're really enjoying that pullback. So just a quick reminder of our goals here for this week. So we're hoping to allow our bodies to get a little bit of rest and recover from the three weeks prior where we were kind of pounding on them a little bit. And we're hoping to be rested and recovered in order to go back into our next training block strong where we're going to take on more intensity, more training stress, more miles. So once again, hopefully everybody really took advantage of this kind of unload here this week. Just a reminder, as always, to keep going into that website or runner portal, checking the box saying I did the workout. I want to continue to chase that 100% completion percentage, putting yourself in the position to be the most successful at the end of this challenge. Now to our week five workouts here, we're going to start with the winter run crew. So we're jumping right back in to those anaerobic capacity intervals. We're doing a combination of one and all the way up to two minute intervals. So the big thing we're introducing this week is that two minute interval at anaerobic capacity. Just FYI, this will be the longest interval uh, of that anaerobic capacity period. We're not gonna all of a sudden have two and a half, three, four minutes of anaerobic capacity. Two minutes is as long as it's gonna go, but we're gonna touch on that this week. Just as before, it's gonna be very important to take those recoveries, recoveries nice and light in order to make sure that you're ready and rested to go give another really hard effort on the next set. So take those recoveries extra light here. Hill repeats. Continue to do that, hopefully 3D calf stretch, get your body good and ready to go in to hit these hills and hit them on intensity. Main set, we're continuing to work leg strength, efficiency, and what is ultimately gonna be VO2 max, because we're doing that threshold pace, add the resistance of inclines, it's gonna shoot you out of that energy zone, working kind of some low end to middle VO2 max there. Half marathon, key run number one, endurance run plus strides. I think you've seen it before. So I mentioned before, there's a bread, bread and butter workout. So don't get impatient with this one. This is solid gold. This is an endurance race. It's run almost entirely aerobically. So we wanna spend the most amount of training time training aerobically to build that big engine for that long distance race. Half marathon key run number two, we have our half marathon pace interval. So we're gonna kick it up a notch certainly this week. What few things we're working on with this workout in particular, we're spending a big chunk of time doing sub-threshold training. We're starting to get familiar, maybe even hopefully a little bit comfortable with that half marathon pace. Finally starting to get a sense of what maybe actually feel might feel like to hold a pace like that for 13 and the 10th miles. So a reminder that your half marathon pace as we listed is a training pace based on a percentage of your threshold. So for a lot of runners, this isn't going to translate as an exact like kind of race pace calculator, if you will, to the race itself and the pace that you'll run on that race. Uh, and for some, it will. So as these intervals start to get longer, you really should be considering, is this an effort that I can hold for a 13 and a 10th mile? Um, and if not, that's okay. You could absolutely continue to use it as a training pace, train that kind of sub-threshold energy zone. However, there also comes a point where you are going to want to practice that actual pace that you plan to sustain on race day. So could certainly be an opportunity as part of these interval workouts, especially if you're starting to really feel taxed by that half marathon pace interval as the workouts continue. Start to think about dialing it back and starting to settle into something that you see yourself holding for 13 and the 10th miles. Just a little FYI, I would say for most runners, being the large major, uh, majority of runners, that half marathon pace that you actually execute a race is probably gonna fall somewhere between your actual half marathon training pace and easy pace. So just know that's probably where like 90 plus percent of people are gonna fall it's into that little window right there. Kind of a big window right there. And then as always, to finish the week, we all come back together for a nice, easy, long run. Half marathoners, we're returning to the week three mileage guidance before we make our next 
two weeks of mileage uh, accumulation. We continue that long run progression. So you get one more shot at that week three mileage before we go up the following two weeks. I'm gonna jump straight into questions that came up from the group here. So uh, question one here was, can you talk about hills and endurance runs? Yay or nay? Many of the Peloton instructors have alternating 4% and flat inclines. 4% at my easy pace will take me out of an easy run. Um, so should I try to hit the inclines but slow the pace if needed to stay easy, keep the easy pace and add a little incline but keep it feeling easy, or stop overthinking it and do whatever I want? So ultimately, um, not overthinking it, very valid question. So ultimately, I would say yay is I would recommend continuing to utilize incline in kind of easy and or endurance runs doesn't necessarily have to be every run, but it's a good inclusion here. That being said is you don't want those inclines to pull you out of that easy pace effort. So that there's the pace range, which is relevant, but more than anything, we wanna stay easy pace effort. So initially what I would do um, to accommodate early is include the incline, but reduce the pace. I think kind of the first option that you mentioned there to kind of you know keep that effort feeling easy. So I thought I'd mention for those people using uh, Peloton hardware and or power meters, like a stride device, and I know now they're, they're being built into some other devices as well, there's a, you know, a quantifiable metric you could use to track this. You can use either your output, which is uh, wattage ultimately. And the wattage is pretty cool when it comes to this because what it's trying to do is mo uh, monitor effort. So what we're all gonna be trying to do is try to match that effort on the flat onto the hill. So that you'll have a, a numerical figure for wattage. Let's just for sake of example, call it 300. If you're running 300 on flat, you start to add incline. Obviously that wattage is gonna go up. Your only option is to reduce pace in order to keep effort consistent. So you can use that actual wattage figure in order to, to really have a, once again, a quantifiable figure to make sure effort is staying consistent. For outdoor and or people not running with power meters, we get to run with the best metric of all, which is rate of perceived exertion. And what we're one, one more time trying to do, so we wanna match our effort, our real feel of going from flat onto incline. The practice of this, very, very important for actually running outside and running races, by the way. So if you're not a very experienced hill runner and you're kind of getting into this for the first time, preparing for races, doing these workouts, you might have to pull back quite a bit to make that effort feel consistent, which is okay. That's exactly what you should be doing right now. As you continue to train and as you get stronger and more experienced running on incline, certainly the goal and what I would expect for you is that the amount that you have to pull off becomes less and less. And in which case, in a scenario, you might not have to back off the pace that much, maybe just a couple seconds in order to maintain that feel on incline. But in the meantime, back it off enough to continue to feel easy, either use a, a figure like wattage or use an RPE scale and try to manage that effort going from flat to incline. Our next question here was on B races. So uh, I said, I listened to Matt's endurance run yesterday where he talked about doing a half marathon as a training run. My real half isn't until May 19th, but I'm signed up for a 10K on March 3rd. I have the ability to change it to a half. Would this be a good idea to get used to the distance and see where I can improve, or is it too early in training? Um, he said, I'm following the advanced run link. So this is a secretly tricky question. Because the answer is you could technically do both, but it really depends on your comfort with that half marathon distance. So I certainly have a lot of athletes that on a weekly basis are doing a double digit plus long run. You know, 10, 12, 14 miles is their standard Saturday morning workout. In which case, that is gonna be a very easy transition for that athlete to jump into a half marathon. Maybe run it as kind of a workout, maybe not all the way quite to race pace, but they don't have to worry about the distance itself. However, I would say for a much larger population of runners, half marathon is a very challenging distance and the distance itself is a major hurdle to, be do, uh, to do it you know, as part of a, kind of a training run. 
what you really have to consider is the recovery from the workout itself. And if the recovery, for, let's say for a half marathon, is gonna knock you back a week, maybe even two weeks in training because the effort is so intense, that was kind of a poor workout, a poor training run, because you don't wanna lose those multiple weeks, kind of including the week leading up to the race. You know, you can be two, three weeks out of training really what you want to be doing is making progress and progressing instead of recovering for an individual workout. So uh, the 10K is a great tune-up and tester race for athletes across that spectrum, for people who are running big miles and people who are building up. And there are a few reasons. It's a, a little bit more accommodating distance, obviously. It's part of the progression to get ready for the half marathon. You have to go past 6.2 miles to get to that 13.1, obviously. It gives you a great opportunity to practice your pacing, whether it's uh, an opportunity to actually practice your half marathon pacing that you wanna use in your longer race, go a little bit faster than half marathon pace and actually run at kind of what would be your, your 10K pace. Both are really valuable opportunities. Both give you an opportunity to put yourself in a, a difficult pace position, practice being uncomfortable a little bit. And ultimately, both races also allow you to practice your race day routine, which I think people uh, don't give enough credit to. It's a complicated process to figure out what time to get up, what to have for breakfast, what time to arrive for the race, what to wear, what not to take, what porta potty line to get in, et cetera. There's a lot to think about all of a sudden. For most of us, we're used to our weekend long run. We kind of roll out of bed, put on our shoes, walk out the door and we start going. It's a very different experience for a race morning. This gives you a practice at kind of going through all those motions to do either the half or the 10K. So what I'd kind of say overall is I think the 10K is a really perfect tune-up race for a half marathon. The, using the half marathon as a prep for a half marathon can absolutely be done, but is a little bit trickier. Um, question here was, would you ever say it's okay to sub a ride for a run? And one more time, it depends here. So what's the workout? What's the purpose of the swap? Uh, and just to, you know, just kind of start overall, ultimately it's your party, so you do what you want to. However, if your goal is to become a stronger runner, then your key runs are going to prepare you the best for that. So in kind of using this, uh, you know, these challenge structures as a, as a baseline, you know, having two key runs in a long run is sort of the minimum in terms of what I would expect to you know, if anyone asks, you know, what is the minimum I need to do to expect progress or to see advancement in my running would be to get those three key workouts in. However, the story changes significantly when you're a person who now works out four, five, six days, etc. There's a lot more opportunity to put that in there. And in which case, yeah, there's a lot of great reasons to include cross modality training in order to train the same energy zones to train aerobically without taking the impact of running. Not everybody can sustain a five, six day a week running uh, regimen. So using those cross, cross uh, modalities is a great idea. So my ideal scenario when this happens is that you, you know, once again, for people who are trying to become great runners, you put, use your high intensity workouts, your key workout days on the run and use your cross modality training as your kind of supplemental aerobic training days. However, I know it's not always that way. So if you want to drop one of your key runs for a key cycle, focus on getting stronger on the bike, uh, kind of alongside getting stronger on the run, you need to drop one of those key runs in favor of a key bike. And what you wanna look at across the scope of the week is that you have a three key training week. Despite the number of sports you're training, you want three key workouts across all modalities there and you prioritize what's the most important to you. Certainly the other scenario there is using uh, cross-modality training in, an, in a time in which you can't run because maybe you're prevented by injury or trying to come back from injury. And so while that is an excellent opportunity to sub in cycling, uh, elliptical, which maybe is a teeny bit better to be quite honest, um, great way of kind of coming back into or keeping your fitness incredibly high at a moment where you can't run. And in that scenario, you 100% can do energy zone matching. You know, if you're trying to train zone three on the on your run, which would be your kind of marathon pace, 
in and around. You could absolutely train zone three on the bike. and You do not get a 100% crossover effect. So you can't take all your tempo workouts and move them to the bike and expect to translate excellently over to the run. It's just not gonna happen that way. But in an injury situation, it's a great way to maintain your fitness. So our final question here is actually another one on hills. So it was just kind of a, a reminder for hill tips of can you discuss ascending and descending hills? And so I'll start with the uphill, which is funny, technically a little bit easier. So what happens naturally is our stride length shortens up a little bit. We're taking shorter strides and we're turning over a little bit more frequently to, to generate power to get us up the hill. That you don't have to focus on. There are two things in particular I want you to focus on. One is keeping your head and upper body looking up the hill. We don't want this hunched over posture kind of coming up the hill. I'm sure everyone's seen it and, uh, and someone else probably hasn't realized that they've been there too, but we want eyes focus up towards the top of the hill. Very important. Kind of the second thing is that this is a great opportunity to recruit your arms into this motion to help assist you up the hill. So I had a coach who, he gave me a great prompt or, or kind of a cue that I always liked, which was like, imagine two drums just right behind either hip. This cue for me did two things. One, it kept my hands low so that I didn't kind of get them up in my chest. So it kept my hands low and it really inspired me to kind of drive forwards and backwards, generate some power with my arm swing to help propel me up the hill. The decline, a lot trickier for a lot of people. So. We'll start with the number one kind of mistake that I see on downhill running. And it's one that would probably occur very naturally to a lot of people, which is actually to lean backwards a little bit, to kind of fight against gravity. Also a great way to prevent yourself from falling down a hill, uh, granted, but you see people lean backwards a little bit. And what happens is when you lean back, you're gonna get this really severe heel landing, which is not ultimately bad uh, on a different scenario. In this scenario, it's not great. And there's two reasons. It's one, you're taking an incredible amount of impact into your legs. And two, that leaning back and heel breaking, it's actually referred to, or heel hitting is referred to as heel breaking. That heel is actually stopping your forward momentum and you're kind of fighting against the gravity that you want to actually be utilizing to carry you down the, the hill there. So what you need to do in the kind of correction here is you actually just want to maintain a, the, a very gentle forward lean to allow gravity to help assist you down the hill there. In order to kind of do this without tumbling forward, which we want to avoid, you need to make sure we're really maintaining a really nice kind of high turnover. So that same kind of cadence that you're running on flat roads, we want to maintain on the downhill. A lot of us, myself included, plenty of times have a tendency when you hit the big downhill, you get this long loping stride. You kind of just want to open up your stride length, kind of fly through your space, and ultimately it's actually slowing you down a little bit because you get the biggest force from pushing off the ground. So when you have this long loping stride and you're kind of letting gravity fall, uh, you know, bring you down the hill in that regards, you're actually not quite going as fast and you're taking a ton of impact into your legs. So we want to be turning over pretty rapidly. Once again, very similar to what you'd be doing on flat ground there. And what it does, it moves you a little bit faster, reduces a lot of impact on the leg. So once again, gentle forward lean, trying to be very focused on turning over. We want the quiet, soft footfalls on the downhill. So for athletes that are headphone runners, in training in particular, great opportunity. Take the headphones out, listen to yourself running downhill. You want it to be as soft and gentle as possible. If you're not, uh, obviously you don't have headphones in, it becomes a little bit easier, but be cognizant of that. Try to make sure you're turning your feet over more often. The last thing you wanna hear is that kind of pounding on the pavement, because um, those are your legs. <laughs> But otherwise, that'll be it for our week five athlete briefing. I appreciate, as always, you all being here on your Friday evening. Have an amazing week five. I can't wait to see you here next week.